Not every woman enjoys horror games, but if you are a woman, or for the men in the audience, if you have any women gamers in your life, you may have noticed that the horror genre appears unusually popular amongst women, and particularly younger women, which is to say girls. Now, that's not to say that women don't play other genres of video games, or that men don't play horror games. Of course they do. There is, however, an observable phenomenon in which women appear to play horror games or engage with horror video game content such as Twitch streams with greater frequency than their engagement with other genres. Well, I can hear you scoff, I don't play horror games. Why, Resident Evil and Silent Hill and the like, they don't appeal to me in the least. But how about Don't Star? Or The Binding of Isaac? Or Dead by Daylight? These are all games with strong horror elements of a very specific nature that have a robust player base of women, which their competitors do not necessarily share. Consider this oft-cited study done by Quantic Foundry, which breaks down different genres of games into proportion by gender. The player base of the Match 3 genre, aka Candy Crush, consists of 69% female players. The family slash farm sim, aka Stardew Valley, is also at 69% female. At the very bottom, the sports genre is only 2% female, which is not very surprising. But you may be surprised to see that women make up only 4% of tactical shooter players, only 10% of MOBA players, and even merely 18% of sandbox game players. Now in fairness, this study is from 2017. A lot of the more popular tactical shooters amongst women, such as Valorant and Apex, hadn't come out yet. And even Fortnite had only just released in July of 2017. But the fact remains, even genres that are anecdotally popular amongst women, gamers like MOBAs, appear to be largely dominated by men. The horror genre isn't explicitly denominated in Quantic Foundry's study, but we can interpret that horror games likely fall into either the atmospheric exploration category or the interactive drama category, in which women represent 41% and 37% of the player base, respectively. Of the non-casual games, this is a second and third place standing. That's a proportion of female gamers four times that of MOBAs. What is it about horror games then that are so appealing to women? Is there something about horror games that attracts women in a way that is distinct from women's enjoyment of the horror genre at large? In this short, unsponsored and belated Halloween special, we'll see if we can answer those questions together and come away with a more nuanced understanding both of horror games and the experiences of women in general. Horror as a genre of media has long puzzled psychologists, sociologists, and various scholars of the human condition. On its face, enjoying horror seems counterintuitive. We humans are hardwired to avoid the things we are fearful of. Anxiety is an emotion we experience precisely so that we can overcome or escape from the things that make us anxious, or at least it's supposed to work that way. Putting gender distinctions aside for a moment, why then do so many of us seek out terrifying experiences like horror movies, literature, or video games? There are countless articles, YouTube videos, books, and studies with all kinds of theories as to why people enjoy horror. This article from the Harvard Business Review, for example, cites research which posits that one's consumption of horror is related to physical stimulation. Watching horror activates our fight-or-flight response. It can trigger the release of adrenaline and other biochemical stimulants without actually putting us in any real danger, which in turn is exciting and feels good. It's like a roller coaster, the thrill of danger without, hopefully, the threat of physical harm. This snippet from the BBC's Science Focus magazine offers the perspective of evolutionary psychologists who take a more Jungian approach. Horror as a genre gives us a safe way in which to mentally rehearse dangerous situations, and thus, the more negative emotions one is able to rehearse while engaging with horror media, the more likely one is to enjoy said media. These general observations are all well and good, but the problem with taking such a broad, zoomed-out perspective when it comes to very personal experiences is that these observations are so broad as to be practically useless. Everything we experience, after all, implicates biochemistry, and at least to an evolutionary psychologist, every behavior can be reduced to subconscious survival adaptations. Neither of these observations, for example, can meaningfully explain why there is such a substantial difference in how men and women interact with the horror genre. Yes, evolutionary psychologists in the audience, that difference can probably also be reduced to survival adaptations, please put your hand down. Reducing human experiences to mere survival adaptations or adrenaline rushes removes nuance. 
Maybe the evolutionary role of women affected their artistic preferences, but considering this possibility gives us neither insight into why these preferences persevere, nor empathetic guidance on how to better interact with and celebrate the activities that bring joy to the women in our lives. Even talking around this point becomes alienating. We are talking about the real experiences of women in the way that Wikipedia talks about the common toucan. Anyhow, I digress. The takeaway is, there are a few different, broad theories that explain why women enjoy horror, but these theories alone are not adequate to explain the differences in how men and women interact with the genre. You see, women have always had an outsized presence in horror, both as an audience and as creators, relative to their presence in other genres of media. On the creator side, you may know, for example, that the novel Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, one of the most important and foundational works of literature in the horror genre, was written by a woman, Mary Shelley. You may not have known, however, that Frankenstein was published when Mary Shelley was only 20 years old, or that Mary Shelley helped to edit and promote the works of her husband, one Percy Bysshe Shelley, whom you may know for his poem Ozymandias. Uh, you know the one, right? My name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. That one. Or consider the works of Alice Giblache, pardon my French, one of the earliest pioneering filmmakers and the first woman to ever direct a film. Her pioneering works included some of the first horror films, which would later go on to inspire the likes of Alfred Hitchcock. On the audience side, there are innumerable observations concerning the unexpected consumption of horror by women. For example, Entertainment Weekly reported that the audience for the hit horror movie The Ring, released in 2002, was about 60% female. 2004's The Grudge had a 65% female audience. Brad Fuller, producer of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, stated concerning horror movies that, for us, the issue now is that it's harder for us to get young men into the theater than women. Clint Culpepper, the president of Screen Gems, has also stated that men stop seeing horror at a certain age, but women continued to go. For some more contemporary statistics in the realm of cinema, let's take a look at the box office demographics for top grossing films in North America in 2023 as of July. Produced here in this chart by at Bulletproof Squee, a worldwide box office tracker on Twitter. We can see in this chart that action movies such as Transformers, John Wick, or the Marvel movies tend to perform worse with a female audience, and that movies that are more relevant specifically to the experiences of women, such as Are You There God, It's Me Margaret, or The Little Mermaid, tend to perform worse for male audiences. What's interesting then is how horror movies perform. Scream 6 had a 50% male and female demographic split. The Boogeyman had a 57% female audience. But again, more action-oriented horror films, such as Evil Dead Rise and M. Night Shyamalan's apocalyptic knock at the cabin, performed worse for women than the more tension-filled paranormal films did. Variety, citing Movio.co, notes that there is a very substantial difference in the preferences of men and women when it comes to horror movies. Women prefer paranormal horror, with an almost 50-50 demographic split in audiences, whereas men strongly outnumber women when it comes to both sci-fi and blockbuster horror films. The prevailing theory here is that sci-fi and blockbuster horror films tend to be less cerebral than paranormal horror. It's supposedly the tension, the anxiety, the suspense, the mystery that many women find compelling, as opposed to some form of catharsis which might be present in violence or action. This proposition, I think, can be supported by anecdotal articles written by women who do enjoy horror, expressing similar sentiments, such as this 2016 article by Lauren A. Fari of The Skinny, or this article by Rosamund Lannan writing for The Learned Fangirl. But outside of the anecdotal, we can see that women prefer more mysterious paranormal horror by looking at studies done concerning an adjacent genre in true crime. If I remember, hopefully I'll have included some links in the description for you to peruse on that topic, but to summarize quickly, studies have found that women consume and engage with true crime media to a much greater extent than men. A 2010 study, for example, found that 70% of Amazon reviews of true crime books are by women. Dr. Scott A. Bond, writing for Psychology Today, notes that his conversations with network executives confirms that the audience of true crime TV shows and podcasts is at least 70% female in composition. Now, I'd argue that paranormal horror, or cerebral horror, however you want to categorize it, and true crime belong in the same genre. The enjoyment the meaningfulness of these two genres derive from the same place. Which begs the question, 
Why do women enjoy paranormal horror so much? Why does a suspenseful, more mentally taxing horror appeal to women where more base elements of horror like gore or violence do not? There are two prevailing theories on this and many sub-theories that branch out of each one. The first unified prevailing theory, and the one that I found is the most scholastically accepted, is a philosophical sociological theory called the Gender Role Socialization Model of Effect, or Snuggle Theory for short. Dr. Noelle Carroll, a well-regarded American professor of philosophy and cinema studies, and vocal proponent of this theory, offers this explanation for women's enjoyment of horror. Horror fictions, writes Dr. Carroll, might be thought to have the function of scaring people into submissively accepting their social roles. And indeed, Dr. Carroll's hypothesis appears to be corroborated by studies done in the 80s on this subject. This off-sided study, titled Effects of an Opposite Gender Companion's Effect to Horror on Distress, Delight, and Attraction, found that men enjoy horror, and I quote, most in the company of a distressed woman and least in the company of a mastering woman. Women, in contrast, enjoy the movie most in the company of a mastering man and least in the company of a distressed man. In other words, the theory proposes that the reason why women enjoy horror is so that they can be satisfied by the embrace of their specifically male companions, thus fulfilling and affirming their gender roles, providing them with a sense of comfort and internal peace. Women like horror so that they can be afraid, which is what they should be as women, and thereby seek the embrace of, specifically, men. It's not even necessarily a physical embrace, just the feeling of being meek and womanly, apparently, is the point. If you're one of the many women in my audience, I imagine that you are probably dry heaving right now. This is, however, the prevailing theory, and this rather, dare I say, misogynistic approach is the foundation for a lot of the philosophical and sociological work done on this topic that has come thereafter. Now, with regards to Dr. Carroll's findings, it's worth pointing out that Dr. Carroll has specifically stated that he wishes to bring film studies and film theory away from what he calls the psychosemiotic Marxism that he feels has dominated those fields since the 70s. So, you know, maybe process his words with a pinch of the old salt. Speaking of so-called psychosemiotic Marxism, however, there is another prevailing theory that comes to us from the fields of psychology and gender studies. I will call this theory, for lack of a better term, the empathetic theory. You will recall Dr. Scott A. Bond from earlier in the video, in our discussion about the popularity of true crime amongst women. Dr. Bond's research suggests that women's fascination with true crime is driven by their empathetic nature, that is to say, women identify with and can see themselves in the victims of true crime stories. You may have noticed that every single study I've cited to and every scholar I've quoted thus far has been male. Women, when writing on the validity of these two competing theories from the gender studies angle, use much stronger language than their male counterparts. This quote, for example, comes from an article on bloodknife.com written by one Lindsay Lee Wallace, citing the Vox film critic Emily van der Werf who states, existing in society as a woman has always had horrific aspects to it. Bodily control is taken, you are subject to the whims of powerful people, and women who accrue power are seen as threats. Which is to say, horror movies lend legitimacy and affirmation to the real experiences of women, including such feelings of fear, inadequacy, or vulnerability, as opposed to hypothetical gender roles. In other words, the gender studies angle is that being a woman is horrifying, and women find affirmation of their horrifying existence through the horror genre. These two theories have something interesting in common. They both talk about affirming the experiences and needs of women. The snuggle theory proposes that horror brings comfort to women by affirming their gender roles, and that by reinforcing their gender roles, they find a place of belonging and comfort. The empathetic theory proposes that horror affirms the actual experiences of women in a society that is hostile to them, that women see themselves in horror movie victims or villainesses as the case may be, and through this act of empathy, they find acknowledgement and realization of their fears. It's scary to be a woman, and thus it is helpful to see that fear can be affirmed instead of dismissed. With video games, though, there is a z-axis to consider. These theories derive from the experiences of women engaging with traditional media. Horror movies, TV shows, and books lack the element of interactivity and choice that come from video games. 
there's not necessarily anyone to snuggle with when one plays a horror game. I don't suspect that you are looking to cuddle if you are playing Resident Evil 4 via Steam Deck while sitting on the toilet. There's hardly any interaction with so-called submissive female gender roles in games like The Binding of Isaac or Five Nights at Freddy's. The tropes that define horror movies or books or TV shows do not always fit cleanly into horror video games. I asked quite a few different women gamers I know what their favorite horror game was, and I received all kinds of answers. Some of the answers I received included games like Resident Evil 2, where you can choose to play as Claire Redfield or Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, where one plays as Jill Valentine. And those games perhaps do have some pertinence to the aforementioned theories given their female protagonists. But what about Silent Hill 2, which came up quite a few times in my informal anecdotal survey? In Silent Hill 2, the quote-unquote victim is widower James Sunderland, and the game's intense focus on psychological horror and atmosphere proved very popular amongst women despite not being obviously relevant to either of the proposed theories. You can play horror games, or games with horror elements, that don't have female protagonists or even female characters. You can play horror games where everyone of all genders is equally the victim in almost identical ways, such as in Don't Starve. You can even play horror games where your protagonist has no discernible identity whatsoever, as you are meant to fill the shoes of your faceless, voiceless character. A proponent of snuggle theory like Dr. Carroll might propose that women engage with Mary Shelley's book Frankenstein through the lens of affirmation of gender roles given the submissive nature of the female characters in that book. But does the allegedly comforting presence of submissive gender roles explain anything about why a friend of mine plays Don't Starve Together by herself for hours at a time, or why she only plays Wilson? Can affirming gender roles explain why my youngest sister loves Binding of Isaac to death but refuses to play Enter the Gungeon with me, hmm? I think not. As such, women's enjoyment of horror games seems to invalidate the premise that women engage with horror as a genre solely to find comfort in their traditional gender roles. Women seem just as keen to play horror games even if those games don't really implicate a gender at all. Video games send a snuggle theory back to the drawing board. As a caveat, of course, women are not a monolith, and there are some women who do find valuable gender affirmation in horror games in precisely the ways that Dr. Carroll suggests. Now, ironically, I suspect that Dr. Carroll would hate that this anecdotal observation of mine corroborates his theory, but I've had quite a few trans women tell me that experiencing horror games from the perspective of female characters is indeed gender-affirming in the ways that Dr. Carroll posits. And so it is not my intention to invalidate the experiences of those who do enjoy horror in the ways described by this theory. It is only my intention to note that the theory is not as universally applicable to women's enjoyment of the horror genre as it is often purported to be, and that this is especially apparent when we observe this theory through the lens of video games. But just as women's enjoyment of horror video games seems to challenge the premise that they engage with horror in order to affirm their gender roles, I think that the empathetic theory needs some rethinking within the context of horror video games as well. I'm not going to challenge the empathetic theory's assertion that being a woman involves a great deal of anxiety and difficulty that is beyond the experiences of men. For one, as a straight male, it's really not my place to be telling women how they do or do not feel. And second, well, of course, being a woman involves anxieties and difficulties that are inapplicable to men. Any man who has ever so much as spoken to a woman as an equal should find that to be self-evident. However, the idea that women engage in horror media strictly because it gives an empathetic voice to the natural horror of being a woman doesn't seem to neatly fit when one considers how broad the scope of horror video games can be. Again, some women do engage with horror video games because the experiences of the women protagonists or characters in those games helps to validate their fears and affirm their anxieties. But the scope of experiences available in horror video games is so much more expansive than horror and cinema TV shows and arguably even literature. But the tropes that inform this theory are not always present in the horror games that are evidently popular amongst women gamers. So if neither the snuggle theory nor the empathetic theory can fully explain why women love horror video games, then what can? Well, I posit that the missing piece of the puzzle lies in the very element that makes video games different from traditional media, that being interactivity. In traditional horror media, one might empathize with a character's terrifying circumstances, but one's ability to influence that environment is very limited. We are spectators, not participants, and so our interaction with the medium is limited to how the medium touches upon our feelings. In other words, 
If you read a book or watch a movie, the plot can affirm our feelings and experiences, but the most we can do is empathize. If we want to interact directly with the plot, we might have to make a fan work. But in a horror video game, we are given the opportunity to directly interact with and confront the source of horror. We are invited to participate in the terror. We are tasked with resolving the anxiety that the game throws at us. And it is the power to confront that anxiety, the power to engage with one's fears, that makes horror video games especially compelling to young women, which is to say, girls. We've established already that women experience difficulties, anxieties, and fears that are beyond the scope of what men experience. But I think that is doubly so the case for girls. I had the privilege of growing up with two younger sisters, and let me tell you something that many men don't understand. Society does not like hearing the opinions of girls in a way that is deeply troubling once you notice it. I was no different for a long time. I was no better. When I was a younger man, I was not supportive of my youngest sister's love of K-pop, and I was disdainful of my middle sister's love of punk rock. I treated my sister's passions in the same way that everyone else treats the passions of young women, with a patronizing tolerance at best, and very often a dismissive hostility. These are personal decisions that I deeply regret with the wisdom of hindsight. I could have contributed constructively to my sister's self-confidence and passions and joy, but I chose instead to do the opposite. We don't treat the passions of young men in this way. Pardon my tangent, but there's this really patronizing video that I've seen a few times now. It's about vocal fry. A disheveled adult man is ordering coffee from an apparently teenage barista, and her voice has a characteristic called vocal fry. It's a sort of crackling sound at the end of a statement. Room for Craig. Why are you talking like that? Why are you talking like that? Because this is my voice? This is my voice. The disheveled man responds by mocking her inflection, and it's a whole comedy bit. This clip on YouTube has 2 million views. When I was a young man, we had similarly hurtful jokes about valley girl accents and things of this nature. But these inflections, these vocal quirks, often come from a place of insecurity, of trying to fit in and trying to figure out one's personality. There's nothing wrong with that, and in fact, I would argue that a quirk like vocal fry is normal and healthy and a part of growing into oneself. And we are annoyed with it because we have very little tolerance for the feelings, anxieties, and insecurities of girls. You may not have even noticed it, but I myself and many men who are in the business of public lectures speak with a vocal fry, and I don't think I've ever had anyone comment on it. Mr. Bond. James Bond. Consider this as well. Global anxiety is on the rise, and each generation is more anxious than the last. The Harvard Business Review reports that half of millennials between the ages of 24 and 39 said they'd left a job at least partly for mental health reasons. For Gen Z, that percentage spikes to 75% compared to 20% amongst the general population. Study after study after study shows us that young people are suffering from more and more anxiety. In the United States, data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health shows that self-reported anxiety amongst young adults ages 18 to 25 increased twofold from the years 2008 to 2018, while the same self-reported anxiety remained stable for adults over 50. And despite study after study showing that these same young adults are dealing with lower wages, higher costs, fewer opportunities, and greater debt than the generations that preceded them, not to mention external sources of anxiety such as social media, their suffering is pinned on a long debunked notion that the young are merely lazy or sheltered. The real fears and anxieties and horrors and uncertainties of young people are dismissed, ignored, and unaddressed. For girls, whom we already have a habit of dismissing as dramatic or unreasonable or annoying, the anxiety, the distress, is even greater still. Where then does a girl turn to when confronted with all of this anxiety that isn't being addressed in any meaningful way, and often isn't even taken seriously? Well, therapy, hopefully. But that's not a decision everyone can make, whether that's due to one's age, or finances, or time, or mental state, or what have you. Some girls and some women turn to social media for better or worse. Others turn to their support networks of friends and family. But many will turn to horror games, because horror games are a way of confronting, and maybe even partially resolving, the uncertainty, 
the anxiety and the fear of being a girl, of being a woman, of being a person in a world that can often be horrifying. Playing video games is often characterized as being a mere exercise in escapism, but video games can also be therapeutic, and horror video games, perhaps more than any other genre, are therapeutic in specifically the ways that society decidedly isn't when it comes to the concerns of women and girls. I'd love to see more research on women's enjoyment of horror video games, because understanding how women interact with this very unique medium has the potential to teach us as a society how to better understand and support the women and girls in our lives. Women enjoying horror games makes a lot of sense if you can see the value of horror games as therapy, as a way of confronting and engaging with anxiety. Horror TV shows and movies and books might affirm one's gender role or provide empathetic nods to one's fears depending on which theory you subscribe to, but the video game is fundamentally different. In a video game, you can fight back against the monster in a way that real life might not allow you to. In a video game, you can figure out the mystery behind the anxiety, even as the anxiety one experiences in real life seems to come from everywhere and nowhere. Horror video games give women agency over their fears. Are you a woman who loves horror video games? I'm curious, what do you think about all of this? What are your favorite horror games and why? Do you think my therapy theory has any merit or am I just barking at the moon here? I'd absolutely love to hear your thoughts. They always matter to me. You might also have noticed that this video is a fundraiser. In consideration of everything that's been going on around us, I'm looking to see what more Moon Channel can do to support the efforts of Doctors Without Borders in addition to our usual 10% donation. As such, I'm going to try to match a portion of your fundraiser donations on this video out of pocket. I'm hesitant to set a limit as I'm not quite sure how this all works yet but I will update you on the results in a future community post. In any case, I've been your host, Mooney. I hope that you enjoyed this short, not too spooky, fashionably late Halloween special. And thank you for tuning in to Moon Channel. Just go let it get to me. Down in Pumpkin Hill, I got some search. I know that it's here. I think, I think, I feel the great emerald power.